stocks, bloodletting across all of the major indices. If you were looking for a rotation, a story that has been uh, popular in the financial media in recent weeks, claiming we have a rising small cap index, we have a rising blue chip index, but it's the high flyers tech powered in the NASDAQ and the S&P 500 that are losing steam. Don't worry, that's not what we saw today. Today, it was all in the red and for very auspicious reasons. This is Macro Money. I'm Ilya Spivak, head of Global Macro here at Tasty Live. And we are going to unpack all of this, see why it happened, see what inspired it, see what logic can be extracted from the price action. Then, of course, use all of that to look ahead to a much meatier bit of event risk than we've been treated to uh, over the past uh, couple of days here, despite the fact that we've had a Fed meeting and despite the fact that we've had uh, the fireworks we saw today in the U.S. jobs report. July's uh, figures here firmly in focus, and we are going to try to benchmark what they may do to these equity markets and the broader financial markets, for that matter, going forward. So let's start with today's market action. It was unmistakable. Uh, what you're looking at here is a 15-minute chart. So that red candle that you see with uh, the uh, arrow pointing at it, that is the precise moment each bar here is 15 minutes, so we've really zoomed in. That is the moment where U.S. ISM manufacturing data comes out. Lest you be tempted to say that economic data does not influence markets, here is Exhibit A. The market was stuck in a very quiet consolidation before this data hit the wires. As soon as it hit, we see sell-off. And this is the same thing that we see across all of the major Wall Street averages. So what was it in this data that generated this kind of a response? Well, it was woefully worse than expected. So we, of course, still have the service side of the ISM survey due next week. Uh, there's an expectation that we'll get a little bit of a rebound on the number from sub 50, which speaks to contraction in the service sector, to a little bit of growth, 51. Uh, but it's the manufacturing side that was with us today, and it was pointing to aggressive contraction, 46.8 on the index versus 48.8 expected. That suggests that the economy uh, – at least on the manufacturing side of the non-farm sector, was not only not growing, but shrinking at the fastest rate since November of last year. Now, it gets worse when we get into the internals of this report. Consider here, here's the overall index. That's the yellow uh, bar facing down right here. And what you find, by the way, here's November of 2023, so it's the lowest since here. Uh, and what you then see is the internals are troubling to say the least. The only bit of this uh, index that registers above 50, that is with growth and indeed a pickup, is inflation. Meanwhile, employment sharply lower. The situation in new orders weaker. So all of the forward-looking uh, indications of economic activity in the sector all pointing to a deepening downturn. Not surprisingly, the markets responded with an expansion of Fed rate cut expectations. Uh, what we have here now is 177 basis points in rate cuts 
between this year and next. That is the most dovish that this has been since February. Now, this is where it gets particularly interesting. Not only do we now have expanding rate cut odds for both this year and next, September looks to be all the way locked in. The market's currently at a rate of 525 to 550 basis points or five and a quarter to five and a half percent. The probability of one cut, at least one cut, is 100 percent. The probability of one cut, only 72 percent or so, and the probability of two cuts now nearly 29% for a cumulative of at least one being 100. So the markets are thoroughly convinced that September's Fed meeting will bring at least one cut. That much uh, has been the case for a while, but now the likelihood of two of them is almost 29%, whereas a month ago it was zero. The possibility that there would be two cuts in September wasn't even on the menu just four weeks ago. And so what we're looking at here is, uh, needless to say, a very potent, dovish shift in expectations. Now, looking back uh, here, we can see that when expectations have become more dovish, stocks have rallied. And clearly, this dynamic has now changed. So not surprisingly, the question is why? And it is perhaps the certainty with which the timing of the first rate cut now in the market that this sort of response function, this, this kind of reaction dynamic to economic data has evolved. While there was room to speculate, and weak data gave you the expectation that there would be more on the uh, probability of, of cuts, but the immediacy of it did not grow. We can certainly see here from about mid-April, basically until the beginning of July, we have expanding rate cuts into 2025, but 2024 stays pat at about one cut. What we see starting at the beginning of July is a sense of urgency. We now have not only growing rate cuts for next year, but for this year too. And of course, now we have our timing. So the markets have essentially run out of room, run out of runway to speculate on the basis of negative economic data that some future time will bring rate cuts unknown when. That speculation is essentially over. Now, the bad economic data that we're receiving, clearly uh, evident from the market reaction that we see here, now that is speaking to why the Fed might be cutting. And it's not a maintenance cut, as some thought might be the case in a soft landing scenario, because now it appears that the Fed is increasingly behind the ball and ought to be cutting because growth is flailing. If we look back here, we see where the Fed's frustration with slowing disinflation gives us a higher for longer perspective. In February, in March, in April, the message from the Fed started to increasingly be inflation isn't falling as fast as we'd like. We might have to retain rates higher for longer. At that time, the cumulative tally was 100 basis points less than it is now, a full percentage point that is less. And so you see this anchoring at one cut for this year. But the outlook for next year starts to blow out because already then, by mid 
April, the market is telling us the Fed is behind the ball. It should be cutting. It should not be delaying. And there will be economic consequences to this delay. They're going to have to rush and play catch up and cut more next year. So even before we get into this sell-off situation in July that we have seen, the outlook for next year starts to expand and the tally starts to grow. Why is the market thinking the Fed is behind the ball? Well, not surprisingly, that move begins in mid April, what else begins in mid-April is a very pointed deterioration, as we've talked about here on the show quite a few times, in U.S. economic data relative to consensus forecasts. Right around mid-April, this normalization in U.S. economic uh, data that we saw from January to February and into March, it runs aground and the deterioration comes. Now, of course, we're below the zero line, which means that U.S. economic data now tends to disappoint relative to baseline expectations, not only to beat by a smaller margin, for example, as was the shift from July of last year into January of this year. We can see the index is going lower, but it's above zero, meaning the data is still generally positive. It's just the margin is narrowing as expectations are adjusted. It's a very different story here, where the data now tends to disappoint, really for the first time since uh, the tail end of 2022. And so, needless to say, today's data, disappointing though it was, fits very neatly into this narrative, and the market response now is, this is what there is to worry about in soft data, because the cuts themselves no longer merit speculation. They are, at this point, on the way. And, of course, this then puts squarely into focus the incoming U.S. jobs report. The expectation is that we're going to have 175,000 jobs added in July. That would be generally in line with the recent range, call it somewhere between 300 and 100,000 jobs. You can see the high here recently, 310, the low 108. The range roughly established here since the end of last year, uh, or even further back, if we want to look at the bigger picture, the end of 2022. The unemployment rate seen holding unchanged, 4.1% in July, as it was in June. That is pushing into some higher levels here, but of course, relatively speaking, still low. But given how anemic these readings have been, it's also a two-year high. So if today's price action is instructive, and if this dynamic is going to continue, we run the risk of weaker than expected data and for that weaker than expected data to weigh on stock market. Looking once again at the ISM report today, we of course got exactly that in spades. So the employment component in that ISM survey, having uh, been expected at 49 came in much worse than expected at 43.4. So much weaker job creation. The expectation for the service sector, which admittedly is a much bigger employer than manufacturing, is for a reading sub 50. So again, another contraction when it prints next week. Now, if this disappoints like today's data, disappointed, then it'll be a steeper contraction yet. As imperfect of an indicator as the ADP private sector estimate of employment tends to be, at least its trajectory, its dynamics mirror the overall theme here. Expectation was for 150,000 private sector jobs added in July, the number that ADP reported, 122. 
and indeed the trend into the second quarter going into the second half of the year has been less than encouraging. All of this compounded by jobless claims data that we saw today, initial applications for benefits jumping aggressively here. We haven't seen numbers like this in a year, a 12-month high here on initial jobless claims. Continuing claims, even scarier, here, this jump, we'd have to go all the way back to November 2021 to see comparable readings. We did get a little bit of a better uh, reading on job openings earlier in the week, but of course, this data is a month behind. These are June numbers, not July, uh, and we did get a down tick, just not as much of one as uh, we expected, 8.2 million job openings versus eight on the nose that was uh, in the forecast, but hardly an encouraging sort of a trajectory here uh, that continues to extend lower. So the overall risk still seems to be that with this data, we are going to get a disappointment. And if that disappointment, once again, in a context where weak data has now become essentially taken at face value, where bad news is bad and good news is good, that spells trouble, seemingly, for stock market. Because if, in fact, we get a soft result, much like we saw with the reaction that the markets gave us today in the face of that weak ISM data, the conclusion may well be the Fed is indeed behind the, the ball. The markets were right to have speculated that over the past three-odd months as data has deteriorated. It will now have to scramble to cut rates to catch up with a downturn in the business cycle that is already making itself evident in the numbers. Moreover, if the U.S. economy is in fact heading for some kind of a downturn, that is happening without a safety net. Because the situation, again, as we learned just earlier in the week with um, Chinese economic data, is woeful for the other major engines of global demand as well. A shallow recovery from a late 2023 recession in the Eurozone seems to have run aground. And now we're heading back into a, a much weaker setting for that economy. And as we just alluded to, the data, uh, PMI data in this case, out of China this week suggests that economy continues to be pinned at standstill for the most part. And so what we then have with the U.S. slowdown, which is increasingly, again, becoming apparent here, is misfiring for all three of the major engines of global demand. Together, they account for 50% of global GDP. The other 50% is intimately dependent on those three economies because most of those economies are vendors to the former three. So think Canada and Mexico and the U.S. Think Australia, New Zealand, Southeast Asia, some parts of Latin America and Africa, the, the commodity uh, exporting ones for China. Think Central Europe, Nordic Europe for the Eurozone. And so... What this increasingly starts to look like is if the only bright spot for global growth over the past year, year and a half, a very resilient U.S. economy, starts to finally fade, and that economy starts to finally buckle under the weight of a historic rate hike cycle, then a global recession, not just a U.S. one, starts to become a live risk. And with rate cuts already on the menu and already fully priced in with very little room to keep speculating, 
at least in the near term, the response to weak data necessarily becomes, well, the Fed can't cut soon enough. And between now and when they actually pull the trigger, the pain will compound. All of which seems to be translating into de-risking. That means bad news for stocks. That means bad news for cyclical commodities like crude oil. It's probably continues, uh, it, it probably continues to be good news for the U.S. dollar, which has rallied up a storm in recent weeks, as well as the Japanese yen, which even before a surprise rate hike from the Bank of Japan this week, which we discussed on the show yesterday, has been rallying off its historic lows as people take risk off the table and in so doing unwind hairy trade short yen exposure. And that is macro money for today. As ever, we are here Monday through Thursday, right after overtime, show that I co-host with Chris Vecchio and Dylan Radigan, looking at the Wall Street close and what may happen thereafter. I am back on with Chris tomorrow for Futures Power Hour, on with Victor and Tom for First Call on Sundays, back with Victor on Wednesdays for The Price of Truth, writing for the news and insights portion of TastyLive.com, and opining sporadically on the platform formerly known as Twitter, at Ilya Spivak. Thanks very much for joining. Macro Money is back next week. Good luck trading.